Where is it? Good evening. My name is Gordon Ozing. Welcome to the Evening with Bruce Lee Writer Series. The series continues April 10th and 11th. April 11th here, Tuesday evening, with uh, from Dublin, Ireland, Evan Bolan. Welcome to come. Our series is funded by Student Activities Council co-sponsorship programs with generous support by Arts and Sciences through Public Service Funds and the Academic Enrichment Fund and through the English Department and most especially the interest and support of the Creative Writing Club. Uh, colleague Brett Singer. My first duty is to thank the Hollenberg Foundation for the money which funds our River City Magazine Writers Contest. This year we're privileged to have tonight's visiting writer, Stuart Dybeck, pick the winning awards. And this is the first time that we're publicly announcing them. First place for the story called Sweetie Pie goes to Louise White of New York City. Second place for Edison, New Jersey goes to Juno Diaz of Ithaca, New York, and third place leading the neighborhood to Lucy Ferris of Roanoke, Virginia. Mr. Dybeck was kind enough to give us a summary of the first prize winner, again that's Sweetie Pie by Louise White. Mr. Dybeck says it's a father-daughter story distinguished by subtlety and a comic grace that by the end becomes transformed to wisdom. And now I'd like to introduce tonight's reader, Stuart Dyback. He has published three books, including a book of poems called Brass Knuckles and two collections of short fiction, Childhood in Other Neighborhoods and The Coast of Chicago. Perhaps the best indication that Stuart Dyback is a writer who's really made it in the literary, literary world is the fact that all three of his books are currently in print and you can buy them. <laughs> Although he has become a widely known poet and short story writer, as well as a figure to reckon with in the literary world, there are some of us who have been reading his stories as early as 1971, when his startlingly original pieces began to appear in such distinguished and diverse venues as the Chicago Review, the Iowa Review, Antaeus and the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. Over the years, he has won grants from the National Endowment of the Arts of Guggenheim, the Whiting Award, four O. Henry Awards for the best short stories, including one first place, and recently, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. It is a triumph for artists as young as Mr. Dyback to have been granted a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy, which puts him, the way I look at it, in the company of such people as Catherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Stewart does his stories as often as not, take us into the neighborhoods where immigrants, first generation Americans, and an assortment of grotesque figures whom critics have compared to the people who live in Winesburg, Ohio, mingle in the neighborhoods of America. Instead of the good humor man ringing his bell to bring popsicles into the neighborhood, it is the Polotsky man the children wait for. The Polotsky man who brings not only caramel and candy apples, but also Polotsky, a wafer and honey-like pastry, which Dybeck compares in taste and texture to the Eucharist. This metaphor, combining as it does, the sacred and the profane, the reverent and the irreverent, points up the dual nature of the golden land, America itself, and the false as well as the real shelter that she offers her immigrant people. His critics have repeatedly praised him for his ability to combine a tough urban intelligence with a tenderness that is almost ineffable. He's been compared to an enormous variety of writers 
including people like Eudora Welty, James T. Farrell, Nelson Algren, Philip Roth, and so on. With them, he shares a love of place, as well as an enormous respect for the geographies of the heart, as well as of the street. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you this evening a man whom we have really enjoyed getting to know. He is a mensch and a landsman, and I welcome Stuart Diamond. Thanks for the great introduction. Um, and I want to thank, um, well, it's the University of Memphis now. I still want to say Memphis State, which it was when I took some classes here, for inviting me. And um, Gordon and Tom and John and Brett and everybody else who's been so kind uh, for my stay here. And all of you for coming out on what I know is a savagely cold night in the South. <laughs> I know that because uh, I lived out here for, for off and on, for a little while at least. My parents um, followed a job here from Chicago and uh, settled in Fraser. And uh, both my brothers grew up here, but I was a constant visitor and always uh, enjoyed it very much. It has always been a great place for me to write. I've, I've actually done a, a fair amount of writing here. Unfortunately, nothing on the subject of Memphis. I, I'm too smart to try to go head to head with Southern writers on something I don't know about. So I'm going to have to stick to Chicago tonight. And uh, I'm going to read for, uh, I guess, about an hour or so, maybe a little less. And uh, I'm going to read one story in its entirety and a, a little piece of another story, um, which is uh, titled Blight and comes from my last book. And in order to read this fragment of it to you, I'm, I need to tell you a little, just a little bit about it so you have a context for it. It's a, the title comes from uh, what actually happened in the southwest side where I grew up, which is our neighborhood was declared an official blight area. And the story um, pertains to four guys growing up there who want to start a rock band. They're uh, Ziggy Zielinski, who is the bass player and who has uh, visions, one of which is that on the night the White Sox win the pennant, atomic war will befall the world. He sees this huge mushroom cloud rising out of White Sox Park, which was then Comiskey Park. The other guy is the, the only one who's got any uh, talent is Pepper Rosado. He's the drummer, half Polish, half Mexican, which was the composition of my neighborhood. And um, a very wild character who um, describes his playing as I go crazy. Then there's the uh, lead guitar player, uh, Joey DeCampo, nicknamed D-Joe, who... Um, would be the lead guitar player, at, I should say, if he had a lead guitar. Right now, all he's got is his accordion. <laughs> but he keeps promising to buy a lead guitar. And uh, then there's the narrator, whose name is Dave. And he, uh, he plays saxophone. And what these guys uh, really want to do, is, their, their group is called the No Names. What they really want to do is, uh, they, they've been playing other cover for other people's songs. And the reason they've got DJ in the band is they want to write their own songs. But um, up to this time, they, they've been playing other people's songs. And once in a while, Dave, the narrator, does a takeoff. I, I'll give you a Dave song. You, you guys know the famous uh, melody for uh, Jerry Lee Lewis's Great Balls of Fire. So this, this would be a, a Dave song. My BVDs were, you got, I'm not going to sing it for you. So you, you, you have to think of that melody for Great Balls of Fire. My BVDs were made of thatch. You came along and lit the match. I screamed in pain. My screams grew higher. Goodness gracious, my balls were on fire. <laughs> so they, they know they're not going to get too far with Dave writing lyrics like this. So they get, so Dejo is a writer. He's a poet, neighborhood poet. And I'll give you a Dejo song. 
It's called Gentle as the Falling Rain. I'll give you a piece of a DJ song. Gentle as the falling rain, every taste, every drop tastes the same. Gentle as the willow tree. Oh, I'm, I'm giving you the wrong song. That's Gentle as the Falling Rain. It's Lonely as the Falling Rain that I want to give you. Lonely as the Falling Rain. Every drop. Wait, Lonely as the Falling Rain. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't written this story for a long time. <laughs> Maybe I should go back to Gentle as the Falling Rain. Every drop tastes the same. Lonely as the willow tree, green dress draped across her knee. Lonely as the boat at sea. The trouble with the DJ song is that he lists lonely things now for another 10 pages. So no one could ever memorize these songs. You saw the difficulty I just did. And um, plus, they never have a bridge. There's no chorus. So you're, they're trying to play and sing a DJ song and flip pages. Pepper Rosado has got this enormous crush on a, on a, a girl uh, that goes to the same school he does called Linda Molina, whom Pepper refers to as the unadult the unadulterated one. And the only beautiful thing in this lousy neighborhood is there's a tremendous, um, on the boulevard, there's a tremendous patch of tulips that the city tends. And it's kind of like a sacred little area that um, senior citizens come and look and women wheel their babies. And it's just a meditative little spot in this kind of a dingy uh, factory neighborhood. There's a knock on Linda Molina's door, and there's Pepper Rosado. And he's standing there with this gigantic flaming bouquet, and she just can't believe that this guy has brought her flowers. It's so out of character. And she stands back in amazement, and then notices that at the bottom of the bouquet, there's all these roots with dirt clots still on them. She realizes what he's done is yank up these tulips, and she's so horrified that anybody could be so crass as that that she slams the door in his face. So crushed, he asks uh, Dijo, to, kind of like in Cyrano de Bergerac, he asks Dijo to write him a poem that will win her back. And Dijo writes a typical Dijo poem, which is called I Dream, which begins, I dream of your eyes, I dream of your lips, I dream of your cheeks, I dream of your nose. You know, he's just <laughs> working his way through that's the way DJ would. And, and it, it ends with the lines, I dream of my arms around your waist, except DJ can't spell. <laughs> Linda Molina is now unbelievably grossed out. <laughs> so that's kind of the context for this. And I'm just going to read a, a, a little kind of a self-contained part from about the middle of that story. At night, 22nd, was a streak of colored lights, electric winks of neon glancing off plate glass and sidewalks as headlights surged by. The air smelled of restaurants, frying burgers, pizza parlors, the cornmeal and hot oil blast of taquerias. Music collided out of open bars, and when it rained and the lights on the oily street shimmered, DJ would start whistling Harlem Nocturne in the back seat. I'd inherited a 53 Chevy from my father. He hadn't died, but he figured the car had. It was a real blightmobile, a kind of mustardy baby shit yellow where it wasn't rusting out, but built like a tank and rumbling like one too. That car would not lay rubber, not even when I'd floor it in neutral and then throw it into drive. Some nights there would be drag races on 25th place, a dead end street lined with abandoned factories and junkers that, that winos dumped along the curb. It was suggested to me on more than one time that my Chevy should take its rightful place along the curb with the junkers. The dragsters would line up their machines gleaming, customized, bullnose, raked and chopped, oversized engines revving through chrome pipes. Then someone would wave a shirt and they'd explode off, burning rubber down an aisle of wrecks. We'd hang around watching till the cops showed up, then scrape up some gas money and go riding ourselves, me behind the wheel and Ziggy fiddling with the radio tuning in on the White Sox while everyone else shouted for music. The Chevy had one customized feature, a wooden bumper. It was something I was forced to add after I almost ruined my life forever on Canal Street. When I first inherited the car, all I had was my driver's permit. So Ziggy, who already had his license, rode with me to take the driving test. 
On the way there, wheeling a corner for practice, I jumped the curb on Canal and rumbled down the sidewalk until I hit a no-parking sign and sent it flying over the bridge. Shattered headlights showered the windshield and Ziggy was choking on a scream caught in his throat. I swung a U and fled back to the neighborhood. It took blocks before Ziggy was able to breathe again. I felt shaky too and started to laugh with relief. And Zig stared at me as if I were crazy and had purposely driven down the sidewalk in order to knock off a no parking sign. Christ, Dave, you could have ruined your life back there forever, he told me. It sounded like something my father would have said. Worries were making Ziggy more nervous that summer than ever before. The Sox had come from nowhere to lead the league, triggering his old nightmare about atom bombs falling on the night the White Sox won the pennant. Beside the busted headlights, the sign pole had left a perfect indentation in my bumper. It was Pepper's idea to wind chains around the bumper at the points of indentation, att attach the chains to the bars of a basement window, and floor the car in reverse to pull out the dent. When we tried it, the bumper tore off. So Pepper, who saw himself as mechanically inclined, wired on a massive wooden bumper. He developed a weird affection for the Chevy. I'd let him drive and he tooled down alleys, clipping garbage cans with the wooden front end and a kind of steady bass drum beat. Boom, boom, boom. Pepper reached the point where he wanted to drive all the time. I understood why. There's a certain feeling of freedom you can only get with a beater that comes from being able to wreck it without remorse. In a way, it's like being indestructible, impervious to pain. We'd cruise the neighborhood on Saturdays, and everywhere we looked, guys would be waxing their cars or tinkering under hoods. I'd honk at them out the window on my sacks and yell, you're wasting a beautiful day on that hunk of crap. They'd glance up from their swirls of turtle wax and Simon eyes and flip me the finger. Poor fools, Pepper would scoff. He'd drive with one hand on the wheel and the other smacking the roof in time to whatever was blaring on the radio. The Chevy was like a drum set accessory to him. He'd jump out at lights and start bopping on the hood. Since he was driving, I started toting along my sacks. We'd pull up to a bus stop where people stood waiting in a trance and Pepper would beat on a fender while I wailed a chorus of hand jive. Then we'd jump back in and tool away as if making our getaway. Once the cops pull us over and frisked us down, they examined my sacks as if it were a weapon. There's some law against playing a little music, Pepper kept asking them. That's right, jack off, one of the cops said. It's called disturbing the peace. Finally, I sold Pepper the Chevy for 25 bucks. He said he wanted to fix it up. Instead, he used it as a battering ram. He drove it at night around the construction sites for the new expressway, mowing down the blinking yellow barricades and signs that read, sorry for the inconvenience. Ziggy, who had developed an eye twitch and started to stutter, refused to ride with him anymore. The White Sox kept winning. One night, as Pepper gunned the engine at a red light on 39th, the entire transmission dropped out onto the street. He, DJ, and I pushed the car for blocks. Never saw a cop. There was a slight decline to the street, and once we got it moving, the Chevy rolled along on its own momentum. Pepper sat inside, steering, with the key in the ignition, the radio still played. Anybody have any idea where we're rolling to, DJ wanted to know? To the end of the line, Pepper said. We crossed the bridge that spanned the drainage canal and just beyond it, Pepper cut the wheel and we turned off onto an oiled, unlighted cinder road that ran past the foundry and continued along the river. The road angled downhill, but it was potholed and rutted and it took all three of us grunting and struggling to keep the car moving. The road was intersected by railroad tracks. After half an hour of rocking and heaving, we got the Chevy onto the tracks and from there it was downhill again to the railroad bridge. We stopped halfway across the bridge. Pepper climbed onto the roof of the car and looked out over the black river. The moon shined on the oily surface like a single intense spotlight. Frankie Avalon was singing on the radio. Turn that wimp off, I hate him, Pepper yelled. He was peeing down onto the hood in final benediction. I switched the radio dial over to the late night mush music station, Sinatra singing these foolish things and turned the volume up full blast. Pepper jumped down, flicked the headlights on, and we shoved the car over the bridge. The splash shook the girders. Pigeons crashed out from under the bridge and swept around, confused in the dark. We stared over the side, 
half expecting to see the Chevy bob back up through the heavy grease of the river and float off in the moonlight. But except for the bubbles on the surface, it was gone. And then I remembered that my sacks had been in the trunk. <laughs> <clears throat> what happens is um, the white sacks do win the pennant. And um, Mayor Daly, who's a lifelong White Sox fan and in fact is living not far from the stadium, decides to celebrate. This, by the way, during the height of the Cold War, when people are building bomb shelters in their backyards, filling them up with Pabst Blue Ribbon for the long nuclear winter. <laughs> and, um, and there's uh, commercials on television about what to do when the big one hits which is to jump under the table and keep eating. <laughs> so at 11 o'clock at night, Mayor Daly uh, rings the air raid sirens. <laughs> this actually happened, and I remember it clearly. In, in my neighborhood, after all our training, what everybody did was, was rush out into the street. <laughs> they didn't want to miss it. <laughs> they dropped an atom bomb, and I didn't see it. <laughs> So, of course, Ziggy Zielinski knows they've won the pennant and hears the sirens go off. As you can imagine, he's never the same Ziggy again. <laughs> I'm going to read a story now in its entirety. <clears throat> that sounds kind of threatening. And it's from a book I'm working on now, which is a collection of stories. I tell you the overall title, but I haven't written the title story yet, and I'm superstitious. <laughs> But they're all love stories in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, it, in, in one story, a guy loves his glockenspiel. <laughs> Honest to God. He, he's had a bad affair with a tuba, so he <laughs> wants something that doesn't require any wind. <clears throat> and one thing when you're writing uh, love stories is you, you're faced with... Um, how to write a love scene, and you know, which has been done seven zillion times, and um, done badly about six zillion five hundred and ninety-five of those. And part of it is you have to figure out what vocabulary to use. Are you going to sound clinical, or are you going to sound dirty? There's not much of an in-between, actually. <laughs> and so when I was thinking about that, one of my least favorite terms for um, an act that has God knows how many names, is doing it. It's not the doing I, hate, I don't like, it's the it. I, I just don't like it's. I think it's a bad, it's are a bad word for writers. It's kind of vague. <laughs> so then I came upon this poem by one of my favorite poets, an Israeli poet named Yehudi Amakai, called We Did It. And um, I decided I'd write a poem in response to his poem. And that's how the story started out. And um, the poem kept failing, so finally, out of desperation, I turned it into a story. And it's got a little epigraph uh, from that poem to start out with. But since this is a reading, I'm going to read you the entire Amakai poem, which is short anyway. It's got some lines in it that I've never understood. <laughs> Maybe you can explain it to me sometime. Six legs and six wings. I, don't, I can't picture that. We did it. We did it in front of the mirror and in the light. We did it in darkness and water and in the high grass. We did it in honor of man and in honor of beast and in honor of God. But they didn't want to know about us. They'd already seen our sort. We did it with imagination and colors, with confusion of reddish hair and brown and with difficult, gladdening exercises. We did it like wheels and holy creatures, and with chariot feats of prophets. We did it six wings and six legs. But the heavens were hard above us, like the earth of summer beneath. We didn't. We didn't in the light we didn't in darkness. We didn't in the fresh cut summer grass or in the mounds of autumn leaves or on the snow where moonlight threw down our shadows. 
We didn't in your room on the canopy bed you slept in, the bed you slept in as a child, or on the back seat of my father's rusted rambler, which smelled of smoked chubs and kielbasa that he delivered on weekends from my Uncle Vincent's meat market. We didn't in your mother's Buick 8, where a rosary twined the rear view mirror like a beaded black snake with silver cruciform fangs. At the dead end of our lover's lane, a side street of abandoned factories where I perfected the pinch that springs open a bra. Behind the lilac bushes in Marquette Park where you first touched me through my jeans and your nipples swollen against transparent cotton seemed the shade of lilacs. In the balcony of the now defunct Clark Theater where I wiped popcorn salt from my palms and slid them up your thighs and you whispered, I feel like Doris Day is watching us. We didn't. How adept we were at fumbling. How perfectly mistimed our timing. How utterly we confused energy with ecstasy. Remember that night be calm by heat and the two of us fused by sweat, trembling as if a wind from outer space that only we could feel was gusting across Oak Street Beach. Wound in your faded Navajo blanket, we lay soul kissing until you wept with wanting. We'd been kissing all day, all summer, kisses tasting of different shades of lip gloss and too many Cokes. The lake had turned hot pink, rose rapture, pearl amethyst with dusk, then washed in night black with a ruff of silver foam. Beyond a momentary horizon, silent bolts of heat lightning throb, perhaps setting barns on fire somewhere in Indiana. The beach that had been so crowded was deserted as if there was a curfew. Only the bodies of lovers remained behind, visible in lightning flashes, scattered like the fallen on a battlefield, a few of them moaning, waiting for the gulls to pick them clean. On my fingers, your slick scent mixed with the coconut musk of the suntan lotion we'd repeatedly smeared over one another's bodies. When your bikini top fell away, my hands caught your breasts memorizing their delicate weight, my palms cupped as if bringing water to parched lips. Along the Gold Coast, high rises began to glow, window added to window against the dark. In every lighted bedroom, couples home from work were stripping off their business suits, falling to the bed and doing it. They did it before mirrors and pressed against the glass in streaming shower stalls. They did it against walls and on the furniture in ways that required previously unimagined gymnastics, which they invented on the spot. They did it in honor of man and woman, in honor of beast, in honor of God. They did it because they'd been released, because they were home free, alive, and private, because they couldn't wait any longer, couldn't wait for the appointed hour, for the right time or temperature, couldn't wait for the future, for messiahs, for peace on earth and justice for all. They did it because of the bomb, because of pollution, because of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They did it because it was Friday night. It was Friday night. And somewhere delirious music was playing, flutter-tongued flutes, muted trumpets meowing like tomcats in heat, feverish plucking and twanging tom-toms, congas and gongs all pounding that same pulse beat. I stripped your bikini bottom down the skinny rails of your legs and you tugged my swimsuit past my tan. Swimsuits at our ankles, we kicked like swimmers to free our legs, almost expecting a tide to wash over us, the way the tide rushes in on Burt Lancaster and Deborah Kerr in their famous love scene on the beach and From Here to Eternity, a scene so famous that although neither of us had seen the movie, our bodies assumed the exact position of movie stars on the sand and you whispered to me softly, I'm afraid of getting pregnant. And I whispered back, don't worry, I have protection. Then, still kissing you, felt for my discarded cutoffs and the wallet in which for the last several months I had carried a Trojan as if it was a talisman. <laughs> still kissing, I tore its flat and dried out wrapper and it sprang through my fingers like a spring from a clock and dropped to the sand between our legs. 
My hands were shaking in a panic. I groped for it, found it, tried to dust it off, tried as Burt Lancaster never had to to slip it on without breaking the mood, felt the grains of sand inside it, a throb of lightning, and the great lake behind us became for all practical purposes the Pacific, and your skin tasted of salt, and to the insistent question that my hips were asking, your body answered yes, your thighs opened like wings from my waist, as we surfaced, panting from a kiss that left you pleading, oh Christ, yes, a yes gasped sharply as a cry of pain, so that for a moment I thought we were already doing it, and that somehow I had missed the instant when I entered you, <laughs> entered you in the bloodless way in which a young man discards his own virginity, entered you as if passing through a gateway into the rest of my life, into a life as I wanted it to be lived, yes, but oh, then I realized we were still floundering, unconnected in the slick between us, and there was sand in the Trojan as we slammed together, still feeling for that perfect fit, still in the here, groping for an eternity that was only a fine adjustment away, just a millimeter to the left, or a fraction of an inch further south, though with all the adjusting, the sandy Trojan was slipping off and then it was gone, but yes, you kept repeating, although your head was shaking, no, not quite, almost, and our hearts were going like mad, and you said, yes, yes, wait, stop. <laughs> what? I asked, still futilely thrusting as if I hadn't quite heard you. Oh, God, you gasped, pushing yourself up, what's coming? <laughs> Julie, what's the matter, I asked, confused, and then the beam of a spotlight swept over us, and I glanced into its blinding eye. All around us, lights were coming, speeding across the sand. Blinking blindness away, I rolled from your body to my knees, feeling utterly defenseless in the way that only nakedness can leave one feeling. Headlights bounded toward us, spotlights crisscrossing, blue dome lights revolving as squad cars converged. I could see other lovers caught in the beams, fleeing bare ass through the litter of garbage that daytime hordes had left behind and that night had deceptively concealed. You were crying, clutching the Navajo blanket to your breasts with one hand, clawing for your bikini with the other, and I was trying to calm your terror with reassuring phrases such as, holy shit, I don't fucking believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Swerving and fishtailing in the sand, police calls pouring from the radios, the squad cars were on us, and then they were by us while we sat struggling on our clothes. They braked at the water's edge and the cops slammed out brandishing huge flashlights, their beams deflecting over the dark water. Beyond the darting of those beams, the far off throbs of lightning seemed faint by comparison. Over there, God damn it, one of them hollered, and two cops slashed out into the shallow water without even pausing to kick off their shoes, huffing for breath, their leather cartridge belts creaking against their bellies. Grab the son of a bitch, it ain't gonna bite, one of them yelled. And they came slashing back to shore with a body slung between them. It was a woman, young, naked, her body limp and bluish beneath the play of flashlight beams. They set her on the sand just past the ring of drying, washed up alewives. Her face was almost totally concealed by her hair. Her hair was brown and tangled in a way that even wind or sleep can't tangle hair, tangled as if it had absorbed the ripples of water thick strands, slimy looking like dead seaweed. She's been in there a while, that's for sure. A cop with a beer belly said to a younger crew cut cop who had knelt beside the body and removed his hat as if he might be considering the kiss of life. The crew cut officer brushed the hair away from her face and a flashlight beam settled there. Her eyes were closed, a bruise or a birthmark stained the side of one eye. Her features appeared swollen, her lower lip protruding as if she was pouting. An ambulance siren echoed across the sand, its revolving red light rapidly approaching. Might as well take their sweet ass time, the beer bellied cop said. We had joined the circle of police surrounding the drowned woman almost without realizing we had. You were back in your bikini, robed in the Navajo blanket, and I had slipped on my cutoffs, my underwear still dangling out of a back pocket. Their flashlight beams explored her body, causing its whiteness to gleam. Her breasts were floppy, her nipples looked shriveled. Her belly appeared inflated by gallons of water. For a moment, a beam focused on her mound of pubic hair, which was overlapped by the swell of her belly, then moved almost shyly away down her legs, and the cops all glanced at us, at you especially, above their lights, 
and you hugged your blanket closer as if they might confiscate it as evidence or to use as a shroud. When the ambulance pulled up, one of the black attendants immediately put a stethoscope to the drowned woman's swollen belly and announced, drown the baby too. Without saying anything, we turned from the group as unconsciously as we joined them and walked off across the sand, stopping only long enough at the spot where we had lain together like lovers in order to stuff the rest of our gear into a beach bag to gather our shoes and for me to find my wallet and kick sand over the forlorn, deflated-looking Trojan that you pretended not to notice. I was grateful for that. Behind us, the police were snapping photos, flash bulbs throbbing like lightning flashes, and the lightning itself, still distant but moving in closer, rumbling audibly now, driving a lake wind before it so that the gusts of sand tingled against the metal sides of the ambulance. Squinting, we walked toward the lighted windows of the Gold Coast, while the shadows of gapers, attracted by the whirling emergency lights, hurried past us toward the shore. What happened? What's going on? they asked as they passed without waiting for an answer. And we didn't offer one, just continued walking silently in the dark. It was only later that we talked about it. And once we began talking about the drowned woman, it seemed we couldn't stop. She was pregnant, you said. I mean, I don't want to sound morbid, but I can't help thinking how the whole time we were, we almost, you know, there was this poor dead woman and her unborn child washing in and out behind us. It's not like we could have done anything for her even if we had known she was there. But what if we had found her? What if after we had, you know, you said, your eyes glancing away from mine and your voice tailing into a whisper, what if after we did it, we went for a night swim and found her in the water? But Jules, we didn't. I tried to reason although it was no more a matter of reason than anything else between us had ever been. It began to seem as if each time we went somewhere to make out, on the back porch of your half-deaf, whiskery Italian grandmother who sat in front of the apartment cackling before I Love Lucy reruns, or in your girlfriend Ginny's basement rec room when her parents were away on bowling league nights and Ginny was upstairs with her current boyfriend Brad, or way off in the burbs at the giant twin drive-in during the weekend they called Elvis Fest. The drowned woman was with us. We would kiss, your mouth would open, and when your tongue flicked repeatedly after mine, I would unbutton the first button of your blouse, revealing the beauty spot at the base of your throat, which matched the smaller spot I loved above a corner of your lips. And then the second button that opened on a delicate gold cross that I had always tried to regard as merely a fashion statement dangling above the cleft of your breasts. The third button exposed the lacy swell of your bra and I would slide my hand over the patterned mesh, feeling for the firmness of your nipple rising to my fingertip. But you would pull us slightly away and behind your rapid breath, your kiss would grow distant. And I would kiss harder, trying to lure you back from wherever you had gone and finally holding you as if consoling a friend, I'd ask, what are you thinking? Although of course I knew. I don't want to think about her, but I can't help it. I mean, it seems like some kind of weird omen or something, you know? No, I don't know, I said. It was just a coincidence. Maybe, maybe if she'd been further away down the beach, but she was so close to us, a good wave could have washed her right up beside us. Great, then we could have had a menage a trois. Gross, I don't believe you just said that. Just because you said it in French doesn't make it less disgusting. <laughs> You're driving me to it. Come on, Jules, I'm sorry, I said. I'm just making a dumb joke to get a little different perspective on things. Well, what's so goddamn funny about a woman who drowned herself and her baby? We don't even know for sure she did. Yeah, right, it was just an accident. Like, she just happened to be going for a walk, pregnant and naked, and she fell in. <laughs> she could have been on a sailboat or something. Accidents happen, so do murders. Oh, like, murder makes it less horrible. Don't think that hasn't occurred to me. Maybe the bastard who knocked her up killed her, huh? <laughs> How should I know? You're the one who, who says you don't want to talk about it and then gets obsessed with all kinds of theories and scenarios. Why are we arguing about a woman we don't even know who doesn't have the slightest thing to do with us? I do know her, you said. I dream about her.
dream about her, I repeated. Like dreams you remember? Sometimes they wake me up. Like I dreamed I was at my Nona's cottage in Michigan. Off her beach, they've got a raft for swimming. And in my dream, I'm swimming out to it, but it keeps drifting further away until it's way out on the water. And I'm so tired that if I don't get to it, I'm going to drown. Then I notice there's a naked person sunning on it. And I start yelling, help. And she looks up, brushes her hair out of her face, and offers me a hand. But I'm too afraid to take it, even though I'm drowning, because it's her. God, Jules, that is creepy. I dreamed you and I were at the beach and you bring us a couple hot dogs but forget the mustard so you have to go all the way back to the stand for it. Wait a minute, hot dogs, no mustard. A little Freudian? <laughs> Honest to God, I dreamed it. You go off for mustard and it's, and I'm wondering where you're, why you're gone so long. Then a woman screams, a kid is drowned and immediately the entire crowd stampedes for the water and sweeps me along with it. It's like this one time when I was little, I got lost at the beach and I'm wandering in this panic through this forest of hairy legs and pouchy crotches, crying for my mother. Anyway, I'm carried into the water by the mob and forced thunder, and I think, this is it, I'm going to drown. But I'm able to hold my breath longer than could ever be possible. It, it feels like a flying dream, but flying underwater. And then I see this baby down there flying too, and I realize it's the kid everyone thinks is drowned, but he's no more drowned than I am. He looks like Cupid or one of those baby angels that cluster around the face of God. Weird. What do you make of it? I mean, drowning and all, like something to do with panic. It means the baby who drowned inside her that night was a love child, a boy. And his soul was released there to wander through Lake Michigan. You don't really believe that. We argued about the interpretation of dreams, about whether dreams were symbolic or psychic, prophetic, or just plain nonsense, until you said, look, why don't you believe what you want about your dreams and keep your nose out of mine? We argued about the drowned woman, about whether her death was a suicide or murder, about whether her appearance that night was an omen or a coincidence, which, you argued, is what an omen is anyway, a coincidence that means something. By the end of summer, even if we were no longer arguing about the woman, we had acquired the habit of arguing about everything else. What was better? Dogs or cats? Rock or jazz? Cubs or socks? Tacos or egg rolls? Right or left? Night or day? It no longer required arguing or necking to summon the drowned woman. Everywhere we went, she surfaced as if by her own volition. At Rocky's Italian Beef, at Lindo Mexico, at the house of Dong, our favorite Chinese restaurant, a place we still frequented because they had let us sit and talk until late over tiny cups of jasmine tea and broken fortune cookies earlier in the year when it was winter and we had first started going together. We would always kid about going there. Are you in the mood for some Dong tonight, I'd ask. It was a dopey joke and you'd break up at its repeated dopiness. Back then in winter, if one of us ordered the garlic shrimp, we would both be sure to eat them so that later our mouths tasted the same when we kissed. Even when she wasn't mentioned, she was there with her drowned body so dumpy next to yours, their sad breasts with their wrinkled nipples and soured milk, so saggy beside yours which were just budding, with her swollen belly and her pubic bush colorless in the glare of electric lights, with her tangled slimy hair and her pouting placid face so lifeless besides yours, and her skin a pallid white, lightning flash white, flash bulb white, a whiteness that couldn't be duplicated in daylight. How I come to hate that pallor, so cold beside the flush of your skin. There wasn't a particular night when we finally broke up. Just as there wasn't a particular night when we began going together. But I do remember a night in fall when I guessed it was over. We were parked in the Rambler at the dead end of the street of factories that had been our lover's lane, listening to a drizzle of rain and dry leaves sprinkle the hood. As always, rain revitalized the smells of the smoked fish and kielbasa and the upholstery. The radio was on too low to hear. The windshield wipers swished at intervals as if we were driving, and the windows were steamed as if we'd been making out. But we'd been arguing, as usual, this time about a woman poet who had committed suicide whose work you were reading. We were sitting no longer talking or touching and I remember thinking that I didn't want to argue with you anymore. I didn't want to sit like this in hurt silence. 
I wanted to talk excitedly all night as we once had. I wanted to find some way that wasn't corny sounding to tell you how much fun I'd had in your company, how much knowing you had meant to me, and how I had suddenly realized that I'd been so intent on becoming lovers that I'd overlooked how close we'd been as friends. I wanted you to know that. I wanted you to like me again. It's sad I started to say, meaning that I was sorry we had reached the point of sitting silently together but before I could continue, you challenged the statement. What makes you so sure it's sad? What do you mean what makes me so sure, I asked, confused by your question and surprised there could be anything to argue over no matter what you thought I was talking about. You looked at me as if what was sad was that I would never understand. For all either one of us knows, you said, she could have been triumphant. Maybe when it really ended was that night when I felt we had just reached the beginning. That one time on the beach in the summer between high school and college when our bodies rammed together so desperately that for a moment I thought we did it. Maybe in our hearts we had. Although for me then, doing it in one's heart didn't quite count. If it did, I supposed we'd all be Casanovas. I remember riding home together on the L that night, feeling sick and defeated in a way I was embarrassed to mention. Our mute reflections emerged like negative exposures on the dark, greasy window of the train. Lightning branched over the city. And when the train entered the subway tunnel, the lights inside flickered as if the power was disrupted, although the train kept rocketing beneath the loop. When the train emerged again, we were on the south side of Chicago and it was pouring, a deluge as if the sky had opened to drown the innocent and guilty alike. We hurried from the L station to your house, holding the Navajo blanket over our heads until soaked it collapsed. In the dripping doorway of your apartment building, we said goodnight. You were shivering, your bikini top showed through the thin blouse plastered to your skin. I swept the wet hair away from your face and kissed you lightly on the lips. Then you turned and went inside. I stepped into the rain and you came back out calling after me. What, I asked, feeling a surge of gladness to be summoned back into the doorway with you. Want an umbrella? I didn't. The downpour was letting up. It felt better to walk back to the L, feeling the rain rinse the sand out of my hair off my legs until the only places where I could still feel its grit was the crotch of my cutoffs and in each squish of my gym shoes. A block down the street, I passed a pair of jockey shorts lying in a puddle and realized they were mine, dropped from my back pocket as we ran to your house. I left them behind, wondering if you'd see them and recognize them the next day. <laughs> By the time I had climbed the stairs back to the L platform, the rain had stopped. Your scent still hadn't washed from my fingers. The station, the entire city, it seemed, dripped and steamed. The summer sound of crickets and nighthawks echoed from the drenched neighborhood. Alone, I could admit how sick I felt. For you, it was a night that would haunt your dreams. For me, it was another night when I waited swollen and aching for what I had secretly nicknamed the Blue Ball Express. Literally lovesick, groaning inwardly with each lurch of the train and worried that I was damaged for good. I peered out at the passing yellow-lit stations where lonely men stood posted before giant advertisements, pictures of glamorous models defaced by graffiti, the same old scrawled insults and pleas, fuck you, eat me. At this late hour, the world seemed given over to men without women, men waiting in abject patience for something indeterminate, the way I waited for our next times. I avoided their eyes so that they wouldn't see the pity in mine. Pity for them because I'd just been with you. Your scent was still on my hands, and there seemed to be so much future ahead. For me, it was another night like that. And by the time I reached my stop, I knew I would be feeling better, recovered enough to walk the dark street home, making up poems of longing I never wrote down. I was the D.H. Lawrence of not doing it, the voice of all the would-be lovers who ached and squirmed but still had not. From our contortions in doorways, on stairwells, and in the bucket seats of cars, we could have composed the Kara Sutra of interrupted bliss. It, was, it must have been 
that night when I recalled all the other times of walking home after seeing you so that it seemed as if I was falling into step behind the parade of my former selves, myself walking home on the night we first kissed, myself on the night when I unbuttoned your blouse and kissed your breasts, myself on the night when I lifted your skirt above your thighs and dropped to my knees, each succeeding self another step closer to that irrevocable moment for which our lives seemed poised. But we didn't. Not in the moonlight or by the phosphorescent lanterns of lightning bugs in your backyard. Not beneath the constellations that we couldn't see, let alone decipher. Or in the dark glow that had replaced the real darkness of night, a darkness already stolen from us. Not with the skyline rising behind us while the city gradually decayed. Not in this heat of summer while a cold war raged, despite the freedom of youth and the license of first love. Because of fate, karma, luck, what does it matter? We made not doing it a wonder. And yet, we didn't. We didn't. We never did. Oh, really? Yeah. Are you the person she used to work? 